Hi, and welcome. Hi, thank you. So before we get into your book, I think people need to understand what cryptocurrency is. It's the latest trend, and it can be so confusing for people. So why don't you explain that a little bit? Okay. At a very, very basic, basic, basic level, it's a token that's backed by a community that uses it. The most famous and well-known cryptocurrency is Bitcoin, and that's backed by the utility that it provides by cryptographic security, which is a code kind of like when, when word sleuthing, you know, um, software and solving a problem, which in Bitcoin's case is a complex mathematical problem. Um, and the Bitcoin has value because, you know, it's, it's built on this invention called the blockchain, where every single record that occurs has is stored openly and has a record of being validated by not just one person, but a community of people. So um, that currency in Bitcoin, in this case, has 11000 to the U.S. dollar. Um, Ethereum is another famous one, $1,000 almost to the U.S. dollar. There are about 2,000 cryptocurrencies. Everyone has a value for the community that uses it. Is there something that's another, something else that's traded that, that's similar, that someone could wrap their head around? Yeah. Um, all the cryptocurrencies like Ethereum are traded and, and Bitcoin are traded on an exchange. You can buy it through Coinbase in the U.S. or on an exchange. You can store it in a wallet. You can convert it to U.S. dollars. You know, it's not a fiat currency, but there are they are digital tokens, digital assets that you're never going to hold in your hand, but you're going to use them through the Internet or, or, you know, for the most people through the Internet um, to provide value for, you know, your project or your company, you know. Um, that is that is the premise of it is um, it's, it's, it has value for the people who want to use it. Your book, Blockchain Ethics, Bridge to Abundance. What is blockchain? Okay, it's a distributed autonomous ledger um, of all transactions that have occurred uh, during the life. So for Bitcoin, um, it's the, the blockchain is this uneditable record. Um, if you trade or buy Bitcoin, people, miners all over the world validate, you know, that this transaction has occurred. Uh, they are trying to solve complex equations. So the, uh, the mining occurs in these huge warehouses in Iceland and Mongolia um, and takes up a lot of energy. But the more that uh, transactions are solved, the more Bitcoin are pulled from the system. And, and the limited supply is 21 million total. And I believe 16.8 or 9 have, million have been already mined. So there's some left. But the more and more equations that are solved, the more energy it takes up. Another one, Ethereum, is based on smart contracts. And that's basically just an executable code. So if I have a picture of a Burger King on my, on my screen and I click on it and it happens to be a smart contract and Burger King calls me and delivers me a burger, that smart contract said they had to call me and deliver me a burger even though that's not something they usually ever do. You know, so that's how Ethereum works and many other currencies are used um, by, their, by their ecosystems and their communities to provide value. So what can someone expect to get out of your book? I, um, with blockchain ethics, a bridge to abundance. Um, it takes a complex subject matter and I break it down and explain what Bitcoin is, what Ethereum is. I also get into some of the social issues going on um, in the U.S. today and how they can be solved and how blockchain is a potential, you know, it's not the only solution, but it's a potential solution for several things going on today. So um, I sell the book on Amazon.com. Uh, uh, please check it out. What, when we talk about countries and, and the economic impact, what, what countries do you feel can benefit? Everyone, okay. including the U.S. Um, I have been in this space since June when I left my corporate career. Um, and I have been an entrepreneur um, and advisor and consultant in this space now for nine months um, and an author. You know, um, I've seen projects all around the world. You know, I've, I got connected to people all over the, all over the world. I advise some companies. Um, and I get to see what some of the other countries are up to. And there's, you know, projects going on left and right globally. So every country, I say. Now, your corporate career, you were with AIG. What did you do there? What was your role? I had a lot of different roles at AIG. Um, and I was always part of a team. 
and I was never the superstar. I was kind of like the, the John Cruck mm -hmm. or the Jose Akendo <laughs> or somebody who was like the utility guy, right. you know, and I was always part of a great team, you know, and we built the AUM. First, my first job there was to build the AUM database. Assets under, management, it's a, it's a, assets under management database, a list of all the holdings that AIG had. Really? Yeah, so I put together that from a global perspective. What I, year was this? 2005, 2008. So prior to the... Yeah, prior, okay. yeah. So my team and I, we put the, together this whole entire infrastructure, and so we're able to help the company, and as a result of putting the infrastructure of that reporting department together, we were able to answer RFPs and marketing questionnaires and all kinds of different questions in magazines to help promote the business, and then the salespeople did their thing and built the business up, you know. Um, I also was in data uh, intelligence for about half a year, uh, competitive intelligence, looking at the life insurance space, and that was right as the, f the financial crash came, and I was on my honeymoon in Crete with my wife, oh, my geez. new wife. I thought I'd never, ever, ever coming back. Well, I didn't do anything wrong, mm -hmm. you know, um, but I say, like, okay, this is, a, this is crazy, because I was capturing I was looking at the credit default swaps for a little while back then, you know. Um, and I even named my fantasy football league credit default swaps. Right. You know, and that's been in existence for 11 years. It's a great league. Mm -hmm. um, and then for a year, I was in financial planning analysis in the front office of, um, you know, fi uh, doing finance, looking at the auto and personal property business of AIG. I left AIG um, for a couple of years. I came back in 2012. And I built their, we, I built the short cash and short term part, but we all built the database that was the one stop shop, the one record, the one go through database. And then after that, our team built the um, the financial projections platform for CCAR, which was came out of the Dodd Frank Act, out of the you know financial projections and the Too Big to Fail Act. And we built that. And that was a few years we did that job. And I did anything they needed me to do. Uh, our team was great. Um, I was I was happy being a utility guy like like Rick Fox and the Lakers, you know. So. Um, so now you're you're on your own. What companies do you advise? I have taken the portfolio approach, mm -hmm. where I advise right now seven companies. They're all my LinkedIn, but I can go over them definitely because um, right. they have they're very unique. Um, but I feel like part of me is part of me has a definite definite social, you know, need and and have the opportunity now to do things that when I was sitting at my desk. And I said, well, I wish, uh, you know, I know what that would, that would happen if I could do that, right. you know. So the first company, Zaha, which is um, an opportunity. It's basically paying, not paying, but having children earners, um, middle school, high school age earners, earn cryptocurrency, earn tokens for being involved in healthy after school activities. So instead of going out and, you know, playing with guns and drugs, kids are doing after school activities like chess or backgammon or football or any other activity they're interested in. And as a result of being involved after the bell, they're gaining financial literacy, they're gaining uh, economic and emotional literacy, and they're gaining currency so that when they're 18 someday they can you know, trade that in for whatever they want to do. But they're earning starting in middle school age. Um, and it's built upon the top of the Zaha platform. The AHA token is built on top of the Zaha platform. And you know, it's a real opportunity for children to get out of poverty and get out of, you know, any kind of bad behavior or negative behavior that affects their life. That's one. The other one is asset token. I feel like the runt on the team, that team is so strong. <laughs> you know, uh, Sally Eves is a top, one of the top fintech women in the world, she's on the team. Simon Cocking, he's a top uh, tech writer in Ireland. Amar Singh has like four or five MBAs and he's in Singapore. Um, the inventor's Dennis Lyon, the core team's been around the, the other for 10 years. Um, and what they do is they have found an API to basically take the credit card, unused credit card li reward liabilities off of companies' balance sheets and um, use our API to do that, while at the same time helping you and I get out of the hamster wheel. Because if we have unused credit card reward points, you know, they, just, they just sit there today, you know? And if you have cryptocurrency or tokens or whatever we want to call them, and they're, they're they gaining in value over time, you're gonna pay our credit cards off sooner. Right. You know, I remember I had to cash out my 401k this year to pay for, um, you know, to, to pay off credit cards. And like a few months later, I was back at the same levels. I was definitely in the hamster wheel. You know, getting out of the hamster wheel is key, gives people abundance, you know. Um, that's, that's two. Another one is um, the crypto police. 
The crypto police. Crypto police, okay. yes. <laughs> as soon as I put the crypto police on my LinkedIn profiles, the people stopped calling me. <laughs> <laughs> they said, okay, I'm not calling this guy anymore. Um, they're at Riga, which is Europe. One of the great things of cryptocurrencies we're able to, and, and, and you know, digital assets, is it's opened up the world as um, to do global finance and commerce. So what they do is they created a great invention for cybersecurity. And it's called the Watchdog, and they're working on it now. The whole premise behind that is that not only do they have used this app to capture a scam, you know, or identify a scam, but the police officers in the academy are backed by the community that will use the police token. In the U.S., you know, we have a 14% suicide rate of police officers because a lot of times they don't feel backed by the community. I had a friend who I hadn't seen in 20 years in high school. I was good friends with him in high school. We got a short house one year back in 1990 or so. Um, he was one of eight of us. It's fun. Um, three years ago, he made a mistake. He, made it, he, he committed suicide, and he had the bounty pressure. No one really knew what was going on. And some of his friends are some of the best, like his best friends are some of the best people on the planet who I've, who I've met, you know? And I felt like a chunk of the earth was missing. I stood in line for eight hours. It was like six to eight hours at the wake. That many people went. He was that good of a guy, but a lot of times police officers feel isolated, and the benefit of being the crypto police is the community backs the police officers. Right. So that's that's huge. Um, I have a beverage company I'm working on. I'm working with a, um, with a collection company, art and art collection company. Mm -hmm. I used to collect baseball cards up until the strike, 1994. Right. I collect movie posters. You know, uh, my favorite is. Um, you lose gold because Peter finally really only did, ever did two movies, mm -hmm. Easy Rider and You Lose Gold. And I think he's a great actor. Right. So I love collection and, and being a hobbyist is something that I enjoy. You know, and then there's another one that I want to talk to about the, you know, about the Stichting Karun Foundation. And I can get into that a little bit later. Okay. Um, what do you think about the state of token economics? It's interesting. It's interesting because a lot of people in the space, you know, wanted tokenomics, token economics to be uh, a utility. And the SEC has come out and said, you know, we see everything as a security. You know, that's, that's, I mean, that's putting, laying some groundwork. And I believe the space is going to be regulated. Now, being an advisor to companies, that I think that helps me a little bit um, with some structure. Uh, but you know, there are a lot of companies out there who are starting up and they want to be able to have to see their blockchain um, come to fruition. and being regulated has its has its path of challenges as well. So I believe they're working on a beneficial uh, solution for everybody. I believe Wyoming just passed some some really excellent laws and leading the way. Uh, Wyoming. Wyoming. And they had their, their state legislature passed um, some unanimous laws to helping cryptocurrency and helping blockchain in Wyoming. So um, I see that as a potential way if people follow their lead to you know, um, to be successful in their states, like some states are falling behind a lot, they might be able to adopt what they did and, and make a difference. So, I, th I think where well, certainly what's confusing to me is so if the SEC were to regulate this, how 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 can they if, if it's international and there's not it's not it's not one company that you're going to go after, right? So how how would that even work? Okay. The SEC has clearly come out and said that that um, blockchain projects, you know, and cryptocurrency is a security. Well, they, they, see, they see it that way. I haven't seen a law that's by Congress, but they're going down the avenue that it's, um, that it's security. I went to graduate school for finance. And when I was undergraduate school, you know, um, I had, had entered a finance class. And what I always learned was the goal behind any public company is to um, maximize shareholder wealth, okay? Blockchain projects are not designed to maximize shareholder wealth. They're designed for the community it serves. They're designed to make a social impact a lot of times, or financial impact, or difference for humanity. So none of it has to do with maximizing shareholder wealth. So, so looking at things from a security, going back to the Securities Act of 1933 and 1940, you know, adding um, cryptocurrency as a security, that's, that's pretty courageous, it's pretty daring. I, you know, I see the leadership taking a stand here, um, you know, making a difference. I don't know much of what that difference is intended to be. 
but I see it as, um, you know, blockchain is valid and cryptocurrency is valid and they're treating it that way. So um, it's an exciting time. Let's talk politics for a second, because mm -hmm. you, we've talked about how this can really help any economy and everything. And the president has said some things about some of the other third world countries. He made a particular comment, which I'm not going to repeat here. OK. But, um, ha, ha, what, what's your feeling on that? I traveled the world back in 2004. I sold everything I owned you know, at the time, and I went to Southeast Asia and China for four months. Um, some of the countries that I visited included Vietnam, Cambodia, um, and China, and Nepal, and then Southeast Asia. Uh, and when I was in Cambodia, I, met a, I never understood this till recently. I met a man, his name was Tet. 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 Okay. Tet gave me a tour of the um, Tool Sling Prison Museum, which is the water torture museum that Pol Pot and his people used back in the 70s to water torture you know, people who were against his regime. The way Tet's told the story, and he introduced me to Khmer Curry, which is pretty good, by the way. Um, the way he told a story was he told it from a place of being proud. His brother was recruited by Pol Pot, and his brother killed Tet's parents. But when he told the story, he told it with a smile. I didn't, never, ever, ever, ever understood that. Wow. Okay. People, I believe, who grew up in a community, no matter how poor that community is or how bad that community is, or bad or good, you know, no matter what the state of that community is, are proud to be from that community. You know, there are different disasters that have happened in the U.S. You know, like Sandy Hook a few years ago in Connecticut. It was a terrible tragedy, but it brought some of the people in the community closer. You know, people are brought closer by, you know, events like 9-11, you know, at least from my experience. Being in a community and an environment, you know, the patient might be a third world, but the relationships there and the history and the pride of where you're from, you know, there's an abundant way to look at life. He chooses to see it from a, an avenue and a paradigm of abundance instead of fear and scarcity, you know. So even though the country might be in fear and scarcity, being in a relationship with the ones who you love opens up a door for an abundant life. Tell me about Skynet Advisors, your new company. We do research. Research. Yeah. I, we provide advisory. Like I said, I'm a, I'm, I'm a utility guy. So whatever my clients need, I do the research. I find out. I help them. If they need, if they need market, marketing, we do marketing. If they need you know, help with the token economics or whatever, we help. Whatever they need, my goal is to serve my clients you know, in the best way we can. And we do that. We have some top-notch researchers. So, and your book is available on Amazon? Amazon and Kindle. And Kindle. Okay, great. And if, I, if you had to pick one, one piece out of, out of this book, what is your favorite part about this book? It's actually the Chrissy Smith story. You know, on December 1st, I met this woman. She seemed really bright, you know. Um, she, mm -hmm. had, she, she had some relationship issues with her family, you know, and mm -hmm. she hadn't seen her kids in a few years. She was divorced. Mm -hmm. and. She took $100,000 and she made some money out of it and now she's doing philanthropy, which is awesome. Um, she called me the day my book came out and she said, thank you for the book because my father, who, who disagreed with her for a few years, loved the book and, and helped cause some healing in the relationship. If I could write a book that caused one person to have healing in their relationship, I made a difference, you know. And um, so that's, that's my favorite part. But there's a, lot, there's a lot in here that's really good stuff. And, um, I wanted to um, come back to the, the countries that we talked about. I know I told you about Tet, and I was going to tell you about the um, Stichting Karuna Foundation. That's in Nepal and India, and it helps you know, children um, through disabilities. Disabilities here in the U.S., people, you know, there's accommodations. In countries overseas, some of them, there's not accommodations. And it helps them to live a better life, live an abundant life, you know, despite their, their situation or, you know, where they're at. Tell me a little bit about yourself. 20 years corporate experience, wide variety of roles, AIG, Prudential, Ingersoll, Rand. Um, I am, like I said, I, I'm a utility guy. I, I take pride in doing good work. You know, I've never been the, the, the Shaquille O'Neal or the Kobe Bryant of my field. I've been the, the, really the grunt guy, you know, and I've gotten things done and I've closed projects and I've enjoyed that kind of work, the hands-on work. And with my clients today, I actually, you know, do the hands-on work. and. What do I do? I, I do anything they need. I have their back with all the projects. And 
you know, I just want to make a difference, you know. Um, per, you know, I have I have a wide variety of um, kind of like, kind of like Alfred from Batman. <laughs> you know, I'm not the Batman, right? <laughs> you know, but I'm the guy like the utility belt, like the old Adam West Batman mm -hmm. utility belt. Oh, I could do this. I could do this. I could write. You know, I can analyze. I can do all kinds of different stuff. So you know, and I take pride in kind of doing that as well as I can. You know, I wrote my book. Um, I started writing on January first, and I wrote fifty thousand words on my thumbs. My editor turned it into twenty thousand words, and I felt like firing him because he cut out most of the book. <laughs> you know, and then my publisher said, "Okay, get it down a little further." So we got it down around fifteen thousand words, and they both said, "Oh, it's perfect now." Okay, you know, um, there are, there's no un, there's no unused word, <laughs> you know. Um, so I, I, you know, I felt there was a must, you know, there, and um, so I had been in the space since June, and a lot of competition, and this current learning curve, being a single guy exposed in the world, where you can just come up and send me messages on LinkedIn, you know, if you wanted to, you know, that opened up the opportunity for many people, many different kind of people, people who think uh, told me about my uncle Sally in Cambodia, and you know. Uh, Aunt George in, in Norway, who would have known, you know? <laughs> but, you know, so you had to sift through that, and, and during the process, I, I, I learned so, so, so much, you know? And I enjoy learning, you know? And I enjoy making a difference. Personally, I'm a father um, of a loving wife of almost 10 years. I have two boys, eight and five. Um, I enjoy the time I get to spend with them very much. Your book? Blockchain ethics, bridge to abundance. What led to this? I saw a lot of things happening in the corporate America, including, you know, the past few years, um, the replacement of people with business knowledge for people who were very scientific and technical. Um, you could trade two for one, they said, you know, two technical people for one business person. The problem is technical people are young. The millennial, Gen Y, the very, very, very smart, I can't touch them as far as intelligence on that, on, on that technical, not even close. Business knowledge went away. So we have a whole bunch of people out there who are my age, you know, mid to late 40s, um, you know, who are out of work, you know, who um, are now, like Claude Robotham in my book, 57 years old and can't find a job, due to medical advances in our country, he has a pleasure and opportunity to live another 35 years, you know. What are you going to do for 35 years? 35 years of unemployment? That doesn't make sense. You know, how are you going to build people's careers up who have all this institutional, these millions of years of institutional knowledge? How are they going to find work? And how can they work in conjunction with the companies who are out there today and help probably mentor these bright millennial Gen Y people so they can lead companies in the future and also build a living for themselves? That's one. Another one is the, is the glass ceiling, you know. Um, I know women who have been high up in appropriate careers in law firms in corporate America who had to take a year off because they were gonna have a kid. And take the year off, they come back to corporate America and they find that they're not at the same level anymore. Mm -hmm. They're down here, you know. Um, Chrissy Smith in my book, you know, 10 years um, out of work even though she had a master's degree in geology and was a top person at AIG in California, she had to get a job at Cracker Barrel. You know, 80% of women are afraid to leave the workforce because, you know, um, they're not gonna come back at the same level. I wanna make a difference there. You know, there are several areas, the financial things we talked about at Asset Token, that all those prompted me when I'm looking at people talking about just the currency and I, and I see, um, what blockchain can really do, you know, I said, this is, a, this is one of the greatest inventions in the past 500 years, and people need to know about it, you know? They, they, need to, they need to be told about it, they need to learn about it, they need to know about it. And so I felt that was missing. Um, and I said, this is my opportunity to educate people. That's what I wanted to do. So we had one of the worst financial crises in history. Um, how did that, spawn the bit currency or cryptocurrency in general? It spawned the creation of Bitcoin. The very first Genesis block, which is the very first block in anything in Bitcoin, has a hidden message. I talk about it in my book, but it, it, it refers to the banking crisis. 
you know, in 2008. I remember there uh, sitting in the uh, diners with my friends on Saturday nights for a couple of years, 2006 to 2008, and talking about what's going on in the real estate market. And you know, that was we were all we were all thought that it was uh, um, it was bubble. You know, we were all preparing, you know, kind of for the worst. And you know, it took a couple of years, um, but. With the you know, banks did a lot of speculative activity. A lot of people did a lot of speculative activity, like AIG and you know some of the financial institutions that are no longer with us. You know, um, investing in you know these backed mortgages and bundled mortgages, and no one really knew um, what was really really going on under the surface. You know, some people did. They made a lot of money. A lot of people didn't really know. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and the inventors of Bitcoin saw this. Who, who call themselves Satoshi Nakamoto um, saw this as you know something that they didn't want to have happen ever again. You know that they wanted to control the you know not control but help people not lose their shirts anymore. You know and have banks not get the income to have people lose their shirts anymore. So they basically created this Bitcoin um, that you know in the very beginning was at a very minimal price and has grown over the years to be a great utility. You know um, cryptographic. Um, Security is a commodity, you know. Not a, people are beginning to understand it more, but for the future, um, it is it is a great invention. Let's talk about the downside. Okay. Cryptocurrency. Sure. What what is that? There's a lot of fear out there and a lot of skepticism, and rightfully so. It's new. It's only 15 years or less than 15 years young. And unregulated. And unregulated. Um, and there are a lot of people who are looking just at the money side just at the cryptocurrency itself, just as the way to make money and do investment, without really knowing what blockchain is behind it or what the community is behind it. Now, some of the best cryptocurrencies, one of the best cryptocurrencies that you know out there is called Monero. It's like the old gangster movies where you have the unmarked dollar bills. Mm -hmm. You know, it's completely fungible, uh, tangible, um, and it's used by the black market. You know, by you know, by people sell drugs, and, um, but it's not traceable, so that's why they are able to use it. Now, it might not be acceptable to you and I, but it is acceptable to the community that uses it, right. like any other any cryptocurrency in the community that uses it. Um, some of the downsides of people and are and people are putting their money into currencies they know nothing about, because it sounds good or smells good or seems fun, you know. Um, but when you look at the blockchain, when you look at the team, when you look at all the operational aspects of it, the question comes back always to, is it operationally viable? 90% of the new tokens, the companies, they fail. 90%? 90%, well, even higher, fail, fail in the first year. Why? Because it's a great idea, it's a great concept. You know, the, the inventor is smart, but it's not operationally viable. No, no one's ever built a plan to have it sustainable. You know, so what is the sustainability is, is, a, is a big question. It has to be viable, operationally viable, has to be compliant. You know, all these projects have to meet a certain criteria. And I don't know if you have squirrel syndrome or token syndrome or shiny, shiny syndrome. Shiny syndrome is very appealing, mm -hmm. you know. So one of the things you have to work out for is, is shiny syndrome. I, I've, I've, read, I've read over like a thousand project white papers, so I think I'm a little over the squirrel shiny syndrome right now, and I'm looking at companies that are operationally viable. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know how to do that or don't know what that is. You know, so that's one of the biggest things you gotta look out for is, okay, what's really behind this shiny thing? You know, that's, that's what I look at. Interesting, and if someone wanted to cash out, so to speak, what's, are there any obstacles that can prevent that from happening? Do they get their investment back? Well, depends. You know, if you're if you're a credit investor, um, you get you can do trading right away. If you're a non-credit investor, you have a great opportunity in the U.S. is called Reg A Plus. Uh, right now, you have to hold the cryptocurrency or, or token, however the SEC wants to say the word. Mm -hmm. You have to hold it for a little while, and if it goes to zero and they're saying you gotta hold this for a little while, you can hold it and watch it go to zero, which is not cool. And there's other things, you know, there are projects where the project should tell you how to put money into the project. And I was awake with, middle of the night with this kid from Vietnam. He sent 0.1 ether, which is $100 for you and I, to this 
company, which is not a viable project. Sent $100. Now, to you and I, it's not much. To this kid, it was his life savings, $100, a million dollars. He was crying on Skype to me, middle of the night. I was trying to assure him how, you know, what to do for next time, you know, but when somebody's crying in tears saying they lost their life savings, you know, it might be fun club for somebody else. Mm -hmm. For me, that's not fun. You know, I felt the guy, you know, I, I heard him, you know, I, I said, you know, this is not right. It's another reason for my book. All right, so a blockchain ethics uh, bridge to abundance and it's available on Amazon and Kindle. Real, thank you so much for being here today. Welcome, thank you.